okay so the last thing that uh, we had looked at is um, is the notion of uh, soundness right we said uh, how do we connect uh, the um, core triple that we had seen with the, the operation semantics even though the whole triples are in fact capturing the behavior that you would expect to see from uh, the um, operation semantic semantics um, we want to formally establish this connection right and the formal establishment of the connection is that if you have a whole triple which is pcq right and assuming for all some for some h and v uh, hvc big step evaluates to h prime v prime and uh, the precondition actually holds on this h, this h and v then um, together right with all of these uh, holding together um, the soundness of whole logic says that uh, q h prime v prime holds right it just says that uh, this is the formal connection between what we mean by uh, these properties okay so that's the analogy and uh, what we will do now is uh, actually switch to the cock development right so we'll sort of slowly go through the examples uh, um, the development in uh, cock so expression language uh, remains the same constant variables read um, actually no expression language actually changes right so if you um so what is different so we have this uh, particular uh, um, read of a heap right so we call that read here so read takes an expression and the idea is that you evaluate that expression that sort of gives you an address and you read the value at that address right and then we also have a boolean expression which is separate from uh, the plain expression language this is so that uh, we can write uh, more expressive programs. We don't have to sort of always deal with uh, natural numbers. So there is a clear separation between uh, what the Boolean expressions are. So we have equality. You can have equality between two expressions or less than, right? E1 less than E2. This is sufficient for encoding our examples. And as we said, uh, our heap is a map from natural number to natural number. Evaluation is a map from the variables to natural numbers. Our assertions are uh, directly encoded as propositions in uh, uh, Cork. So you have a heap, valuation, and uh, you can write any proposition that you can write in uh, Cork in this model, right? So our assertions are that. And uh, and the these are all, um, this, is, this is fine, this is okay, this is what we've seen earlier. This is uh, different in the sense that uh, if takes a Boolean expression, in the predicate, right? And then, then an else parts or commands. Observe that this is a Boolean expression. In the previous uh, iteration, um, this was a plain expression, right? We didn't separate out the Boolean expressions from uh, the um, expressions that return a natural number. We have sequencing, which is the same. And then we have write, which is equivalent to the write into the heap, right? So you have a E1, E2. Uh, the idea is that you evaluate E1 that gives you an address and you store this value at this address, right? So which is uh, which is the reason why it takes a E1, E2. And then uh, while takes a assertion, right? This is the loop invariant that we have to explicitly attach because uh, we cannot automatically, um, loop invariant cannot be automatically inferred. It is not syntax directed, right? It has to explicitly be provided. Um, we have a Boolean expression and then uh, the body is a command. So Boolean expression and the body is a command. And we also have this assert, right? So assert is uh, a command that takes an assertion. So we just take an assertion. What is an assertion? Assertion is just a function from keep to valuation to prop, right? So uh, that's that. And the one thing we do is uh, we introduce a shorthand for looking up uh, uh, in a finite map, right? If I look up a key in a finite map, if it is bound to some number, we just return that number. Instead of returning an option value, we always return zero. So if you look up a particular value um, and then it is not bound, we just return zero. And you can sort of think about this, right? What is it trying to capture? Um, this is a nice way of modeling um, the memory where uh, you can imagine the memory to be 
uninitialized first. Sorry, you can imagine the memory to be initialized to zero first. The whole heap is just zero. So what happens in C? In C, if you just uh, make up a pointer and read it, you'll get garbage out, right? Because that is uninitialized memory. Um, thanks to this, the, the whole point of having this is that uh, um, instead of just saying, OK, this is uninitialized, where you get a none, we always uh, uh, look up. If it has some value in the valuation, we just return n. Otherwise, we just return 0 here. Um, this is a matter of convenience, right? We just want this heap to be something that is that acts like a heap. Um, in C, you don't uh, you don't get an error if you read an uninitialized uh, value. We just want to make sure that uh, it's it's a con it's a matter of convenience because um, because why um, if you just think about uh, what should happen here, right? Here I evaluate the expression and then. Uh, I sort of say, go and read the value of the expression. So I, whenever I evaluate the expression, right? whenever I interpret the expression in the fixed point, I expect uh, a natural number as a result. But uh, because this is looking up uh, in a map, uh, um, I, I won't always get a natural number. I can get an optional value. Uh, same with here, right? And hence, uh, I sort of say, return 0 for those uh, variables and uh, um, so those variables and uh, uh, those locations which are uninitialized. This is like, a, I mean, this has deeper implications than what I'm trying to get at is this has deeper implications than uh, just what is written down here. We are actually modeling what we would expect in the real world. Right? Um, OK, so that's fine. And now, thanks to that, right? Uh, these will always return natural numbers. So whenever I look up. Uh, a variable which is not there in the valuation or heap uh, lo heap location which is uninitialized, which you haven't touched before, you will always get a zero. The other ones are just plain old uh, uh, things that we've seen earlier, right? Recursive interpretation of uh, um, the sub expressions and then do the corresponding arithmetic operation to get the result. Okay. Then you have the Boolean expression. Uh, yeah, it's not a fixed point, is it? So let's. Change it to a definition. Okay, so Boolean expression, um, yeah, takes a takes a heap and evaluation. You interpret that. Here we are uh, using double equals n to indicate we are doing natural number comparison, right? So natural number equality. So if it is really equal, then we return true. Otherwise, we return false. These are these are going to return Boolean values, right? And less than is again. This is just a syntax for the uh, less than or equal to on natural numbers. Um, don't worry about the syntax, right? Yeah. So cock is very expressive. So we have to play all of these uh, games to deal with uh, basic types and so on. So yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so it's uh, the order is flipped. So this is uh, e2 less than e1. If e2 is less than e1, then we return false, else we return true. I think uh, I suspect that uh, is it the case. I don't know. I don't know why this is the case. Why it's been returned in this flip form. Anyway, if I find this out, uh, I will tell you. Okay, so that's Boolean expression, and then we have the um, big step operational semantics, right? Um, we have to write this as inductive because our program program the language that we define as uh, is essentially uh, Turing complete, right? So because we have a while and then arbitrary locations that can be modified. So unlike earlier, we have a heap and evaluation, right? Under command and then goes to a heap and evaluation. This mirrors uh, what we have uh, here, right? Heap valuation command, big step evaluates to heap valuation, right? So what is interesting here? I don't. This is all plain, plain old standard uh, definition. So I'm, I'm not going to. It's just a plain old translation. Uh, yeah, something might be which might be interesting is that um, observe that uh, for assertion, right? For H, we assert A, which is what uh, we have here. Um, yeah, H, we assert A. Um, if the if the assertion actually holds on H and V, right? Then we say H. 
um, this this big step evaluates to HV, just the just the HV at the uh, that was present, right? And the way it transforms to here is uh, because uh, because of the type, our assertion is a function that takes a heap and evaluation and returns a proposition, right? And in Coq, uh, uh, a proposition can appear on the left hand side of uh, this arrow, this implication arrow. So we can just write it as HV. Um, uh, AHP. Um, this is this is interesting because we are sort of mixing the language that we are defining here. This language, right? The language that we are defining here with the language that we are actually using to um, formalize this uh, this uh, language here. So um, in PL literature, right? So there is there are these two languages. So we have what what do we have? We have the language, the command language that we have here, right? And then underneath it, we are using the Galena language to encode it, right? The the idea here is that uh, we are actually simulating. So while Galena does not have uh, um, heaps, right? We are actually simulating heaps. So in order to talk about these two languages, we are uh, we will. I mean, it is typical to call this language as the um, object language, right? And uh, the language that we actually use to write down the object language gives semantics. We call the meta language. Um, so in our setting, the meta language happens to be um, Coq, uh, Galena, right? The Galena language that we are uh, using within Coq. So this is. The reason why this, uh, I thought uh, I would explain this is this is interesting because I'm taking a construct which uh, this construct is actually sort of uh, not fully defined. This assertion type is not fully defined within the uh, object language because uh, we don't have a manifestation of what a prop is, right? This this prop is a thing that lives in the um, meta language, not in the object language, right? So. Um, yeah, and then we are sort of uh, using that here because that lives in the meta language. We can we can actually use it here. Um, we won't go too much into uh, actually we won't study this in this course, um, but uh, but there is this notion of uh, when we when we sort of design these languages and then uh, um, reason about the languages say in Coq or um, F star or even like simple things like uh, I just want to uh, encode a state machine for say HTTP in OCaml, right? There are these two languages that are in practice, right? One is the HTTP language, which what is the HTTP language? It defines a protocol. You can think of protocol as a language, right? So there's an input, there is an output, there is a request that has to have a particular format and there is a response. Um, so this sort of idea of uh, um, writing interpreters for, uh, for one language appears everywhere, right? In, uh, HTTPS is one example. Um, oh, SSL, right? The SSL, uh, uh, which is the security layer that we all use, right? The foundational security uh, layer that uh, powers the internet, right? Uh, SSL, TLS, and so on have their own language as well. And uh, the implementations such as OpenSSL and uh, uh, TLS are all sort of the interpreters of uh, those languages. And um, and the concept that often appears is that uh, here uh, uh, there is this concept of uh, embedding, right? We won't talk too much about this in the rest of the lecture, but there's this notion of embedding, which is that uh, we can encode certain features in the um, object language, the language that we are actually studying, right? And interpreting using the features in the host language, the meta language, right? And uh, this is one such example, right? You cannot fully, I mean, we just, uh, if you sort of think about it, this assertion, right, is part of uh, the object language because assert says that uh, the content of this is assertion. But really, the assertion is uh, uh, defined as a proposition. And the object language does not say what a proposition is. We are actually using the meta language notion of proposition in order to define things in the object language. And the sort of um, using these features is known as uh, um, shallow embedding, right? So again, these are all just terms. If you forget it, don't worry. 
there is also this notion of uh, deep embedding uh, sorry this is called as deep embedding and there is no notion of shallow embedding where uh, um, you do not use any features from uh, uh, the um, the host language the meta language that is sitting underneath you encode everything in the object language right and uh, we sort of done this uh, over and over without even describing it too much even this idea of a heap right um, actually the heap is fine but uh, this uh, this assertion is the first time we are actually looking at uh, this notion of uh, mixing things between the shallow uh, between the host language and the uh, um, the object language right so there is something interesting going on if it looks odd then uh, what we are doing here is uh, deep embedding uh, we've not uh, done this deep embedding embedding so far right we've not used uh, an actual feature uh, that is available in the meta language the host language to encode things in the object language right i'll sort of uh, not uh, uh, not say anything more because it is not useful but in the frap book right there is a chapter called if you are interested there is a chapter on uh, deep versus shallow embedding and uh, sort of um, tells you what is the advantage of uh, either of the embeddings and often times we end up using a mixer embedding right it it uh, sort of uh, gives you um, an intuition behind why we we want to consider different styles of embedding and what is the embedding that we want to go for for encoding expressive languages right so just uh, just a digression but uh, let's get back okay so that's the that's the thing about assertion right it's it's doing something interesting is what i want you to uh, recognize so that's the operational semantics and then we have uh, the encoding for uh, the whole triples right so maybe let's just uh, pick um, a concrete one to analyze so let's do let's do hmm. let's do um, if then else right okay so so here is uh, whole triple for if right and um, the whole triple is read as uh, p right the precondition the actual command right and the post condition observe that the post condition is a function right over uh, um, h and v in fact p is also a function over h and v right so um, and uh, what this says is that uh, there are two post conditions q1 hv or q2 hv that can hold right that is what we've seen here we make it full screen so that it is easier to switch so there are two um, post conditions q1 q2 which might hold and uh, this is obtained by oops um let me go back oops uh one second it's going automatically I don't know why okay i should do slide show i believe so let's enter full screen so okay so yeah so there are uh, two um two premises right so here is one here is the other one and the way we define that is uh, there are going to be uh, two preconditions right one for uh, saying that um, uh, the precondition holds and then uh, the boolean expression evaluates to true in which case you execute the true case and the post condition is q1 and similarly for the second one which is uh, php and uh, the boolean expression evaluates to false and you evaluate c2 and the, and the post condition that is ensured is q2 right so that is what we have here um yeah so the rest of it uh, is just a direct translation okay so the one thing that uh, we have here is uh, we have a rule of consequence which is very general right which says that uh, uh, a whole triple p prime c q prime holds if p c q holds and uh, the precondition p prime right is actually a stronger precondition than uh, what is uh, actually held here right you can strengthen your precondition right here or you can weaken your post condition right so uh, if q holds 
if q prime is actually weaker than uh, what is uh, um, q then uh, you can um, you can you can strengthen and weaken right on both sides often times what will happen is that uh, um, we will only sort of uh, um, look at uh, one side so we will always do um, strengthen the post conditions because uh, because uh, our, all of our uh, logic is written um, top to bottom so if you sort of look at um, how we written all of the rules it is always uh, it is always okay given a p this is what happens after it given a p this is what happens after it and hence uh, all we end up doing all we end up using in practice is that uh, we will only use one side of it we will only strengthen the post conditions we won't uh, weaken the pre conditions you will also see if you've read the other papers um the sort of uh, or, or lecture materials that look at code triple uh, they might also do it in the backward fashion right they will say um so given a p post condition what should be the pre condition at which i should execute the program in order to satisfy that post condition right this is also useful because you can sort of run through this in a so you've seen this compiler analysis right just forward face and backward face similar thing uh, you can sort of imagine here right you can uh, um, this sort of form is useful when you want to say okay i have a post condition i want to prove that the post condition is true um some many times you can also look at it in the reverse you can sort of uh, look at it as uh, assuming true is the post condition right i execute the program what is the abstraction of the program what is the three conditions i need to execute the program so that i have true or say x is greater than 0 right so you can sort of imagine you can sort of get the three conditions for executing a particular function by reasoning reasoning about it backwards right so that is also perfectly possible um so but we are looking at uh, things in the forward direction so we give a precondition and we are sort of uh, telling you what the post condition is okay, okay. so this is trying to show the um what is it trying to do um yeah this is uh, this is basically the um, soundness proof right so the soundness proof here says that uh, pcq holds mixed up holds then p holds then q h prime v prime holds so four triple pc q the pre condition post condition holds you can for all h v h prime v prime you you execute c under h v it gives me h prime v prime uh, pre condition holds on h v then the post condition also holds right so this is what we want to prove i am not going to go through the proof here because the proof uh, is sort of uh, if you sort of imagine right there is no complexity because we are matching one to one we are actually syntactically capturing what is happening the only interesting bit is uh, this um, uh, while case which has this separate uh, loop invariant that is sitting in the operation semantics that has to somehow be connected in the uh, whole triple when we describe the whole triple that is the separate lemma that we prove here again the details are not important uh, but the proof actually is very simple and it goes through the only step is this um, um, connective lemma for the while so i am not going to go through this in detail so let's uh, skip that um so we've defined uh, the syntax right so we've uh, we've sort of defined the concrete uh, um the abstract syntax for uh, the uh, command language but we also have the abstract syntax for the proposition right we will write p q uh, the pre condition post condition in order to make it appear nicer we are going to introduce some notations again i'm not going to explain the notations we will actually start seeing examples right so um so for uh, for the pre and post conditions we use this syntax so this is sort of like a function right this pre and post conditions are like a function where you where you write uh, um pre and post conditions are functions uh, that are parameterized over h and v right you have h we use ambersan um v and then tilde arrow and then you can have uh, any um any proposition here right so anything that you can uh, describe on this and then uh, we use this syntax for uh, actual whole triples so you write uh, double open braces p 
C, double open braces uh, Q, close double open braces for the whole trick one. Right, so um, that is what we have. And this is the strength and post condition that we um, that we described. So we have the rule of consequence, which says that you can uh, you can sort of uh, prove a weaker uh, post condition or the stronger precondition, right? We only want the post condition side uh, often in practice. We actually don't care about the precondition side. So what this says is that um, so this is this is sort of uh, just a specialization of this rule here. Right, so let's look at this rule. So instead of Q prime, if you just imagine this to be Q, sorry, uh, instead of P prime, imagine this to be just P, right? So this will go away, right? We don't need this anymore. This will be P, C, Q prime. And you will have P, C, Q here. You will just have uh, this particular premise, which is what uh, we have here. So we are not changing the precondition. We are only... Um, uh, changing the post condition, we are actually strengthening it. So you, because we apply everything backwards, right? So um, if we have some PCQ prime, what we will say is that, oh, I will actually show you a stronger uh, um, post condition, right? So the stronger post condition is Q. And I claim that this is stronger, which means that I should also show that uh, Q H H V implies Q prime H V, right? So this is what we will often use in practice. And this is a direct consequence of uh, the consequence rule. So um, the proof itself is very simple. So that goes through. So the other thing that I mentioned is that uh, um, core logic nicely leads to an automated verification uh, strategy, right? Which is that um, um, for every step that you want to say um, prove that the whole triple um, actually holds, what you can do is you can either apply the syntactic rule if it unifies, or you apply the rule of consequence, right? We this we in in particular the we strengthen the post condition to some Q prime, right? And then we will separately show Q prime implies Q. And I said uh, we can discharge this with an SMT solver. This is what uh, automated verification tools do. I want to simulate this uh, um, in a simple fashion in POC. Okay, so. What we will do is we will describe a very simple solver. I don't even want to call this solver. This is like a small tactic that um, discharges proofs on linear arithmetic. We have some tactics, right? Like ring and linear arithmetic. We will just use that to discharge it. So here is, uh, here is how I do it. So this is the tactic, right? This is the, you can think of this as a solver, right? So dis to discharge, um, um, the proof obligation, right? Uh, again, I'm not going to go through uh, this in detail. There is some, if you find a less than, then it says, uh, try to do destruct on less than, try to discriminate and uh, keep going. At the end of the day, it is trying auto equality linear arithmetic, right? Don't uh, look at the detail, but it's just, uh, you can sort of think about this as a very small solver for the, uh, um, inequalities right so and we have less than or equal to here our um, for the examples that we will look at our um, constraints that we are going to discharge are going to look uh, fit this uh, style so we will use this t tactic as a solver to discharge uh, the side conditions that we build up here any q prime implies q that we build up we will discharge it through that okay so this is a uh, ht1 is just a direct application of uh, one of the rules, right? One of the cases that we have in the whole logic rules that corresponds to this one, right? So you precisely apply one of the rules if it applies. Otherwise, uh, we have to sort of uh, do this uh, weakening, right? Strengthening, sorry, strengthening that is uh, that is here. Um, and then we will have to do the, uh, solve the tactic that is sub sitting separately here. So, here is a simple automated prover for uh, core logic. We will, we will see what we are going to prove. We will simplify, repeatedly apply HT1, right? We will keep keep applying uh, HT1 so that uh, we either strengthen the post conditions and generate a side condition, or we directly apply matching syntactic rule and discharge it, right? So eventually, you will have built up a, 
set of constraints which are all sort of conjunctions of q q prime plus q right all of these are going to be on uh, arithmetic and they are going to be inequalities which we are going to we are repeatedly applying ht1 which we are going to discharge through t right so that's uh, that is uh, what we have here so before i um, go through the cock development i just want to go through um, one of my um, i've written this down uh, on paper it is useful to sort of look at it on paper before uh, um, before we actually look at the cock one yeah okay so so we saw the rule here so i mean one of the um, small programs that you can actually prove is uh, swapping right this is a very simple swap using a temporary um, we want to show that the swap code actually um, does swapping right when i when i say this uh, what we want to do is to have a specification for the what swapping does right here is a swap definition which i'm going to swap x and y so it copies x to temp um, copies y to x and then uh, copies temp to y right we know this is swap uh, this this is how we expect this to work we can formally prove this right and the way we do it is uh, we write a precondition right where we say um, we are not going to deal with heap here but heap is going to always uh, be present here but let's ignore it for now the precondition is that uh, um, the x x variable is a y is b right at the initially and uh, when it ends i want to show that x has b and y has a where a and b are uh, natural numbers right so this is the this is the pre and post conditions that i want to do on this program so i have actually written down what i want to show right the actual implementation the specification and um, the proof of this is applying the bohr logic rules and making it uh, succeed right so that is uh, what uh, we are going to try to do now so as we've done before right we will consider all of this to be just p right so our assignment rule expects arbitrary p on uh, the precondition let's call it p we just keep applying each of the assignment rule right just to make it go through so first uh, we have the first step which is um, uh, store into temp the value fx so what that does if you just substitute the um, variables in the assignment row it says that given this precondition p the post condition has a h and b such that there exists a v1 the valuation this valuation again corresponds to the valuation of the precondition where the, the current v is v1 where the, the temp has binding for a and what is a a is just the value for x right we um the value value of x is a so it extends uh, temp with a and otherwise everything remains the same and uh, the next thing that we have is uh, p h v1 holds right this is the um, step that we had for uh, let me find out where it is yeah so we said the p h v prime holds right so if you sort of expand p h v prime in place and that will expand to applying v1 here right so v1 of uh, uh, xa holds and v1 of y y equals b holds right we just expand in place and similarly go for the next step which is uh, uh, storing y to x and similarly uh, there will exist a v2 right this is uh, this is just uh, naming so there will exist a v2 and this v2 refers to the valuation in the um, precondition which is the post condition for the previous step so we have this connection going all the way through right so v2 refers to v and the only way um, uh, v is defined as it extends v2 with x to b um, yeah so why is xp uh, oh is it wrong oh sorry x is b right so because i read up uh, i look at the value of y the value of y is b right and then i use that value of y is b right and i sort of use that and store to x so i map x to b here 
right? And then the rest of the condition is uh, pH V2 should hold. If you expand that in place, this is the whole thing, right? And instead of in for V here, we substitute V2. And then that is what I have uh, here. Just copy pasted that, right? There exists a V here that becomes V2 here. Everything else stays the same. So I'm just substituting for the, the sake of uh, illustration. And similarly, for the last one, I have a V3. Um, this V3 refers to the V in the previous, uh, um, the post condition of the previous command, which is the precondition for this command, right? And uh, temp happens to be A. So we, so we define the valuation here as V3 um, with uh, extended width Y to A, right? And pH V3. So you take this entire thing, right? Substitute uh, uh, H for H and V3 for V. So you will get this term, right? This whole term here. Okay. So that is what we have, right? And we really want to show this as the actual important implicit um, um, the intuitive, right? The intuitive uh, post condition, but what we built up is uh, this term here, right? And if you just focus on just the valuation, right? I'm ignoring everything else. So initially, uh, we have a V1 where uh, there is some V0. I don't care about what that V0 is. All I said is uh, initially uh, X was A and Y was B, right? So there was some V0 and V1 was defined as X is A and Y was B and V2, Right, um, where is V2? V2 is defined as V1 extended with uh, uh, where uh, temp is now A. V2 is V1 where temp is A. If you again expand in place, uh, you will see temp is A here, right? And this will all remain the same. And similarly, V3 is V2 where uh, X is B, right? V3 is V2 where X is B. If you expand it, you get this term. Um, I am sort of uh, dropping this X to A binding from here because uh, this X to B binding anyway shadows that one. And similarly, the last V, right, is uh, V3 um, where you extend Y to A, V3 where you extend Y to A, which is uh, going to shadow this definition. So Y to A appears here. So uh, sorry for the, this one. This looks odd. But if you sort of, if you sort of take this valuation, and then you write it again as a functional way. It's uh, lambda h v, right? v of x is b, right? v of x is b. v of y is a, right? v of y is a. And there is also v of temp is a, right? This is the additional information that we've actually built up. This is uh, sort of carrying stronger. I mean, this is actually stronger, strong enough to imply what we actually want to show, which is v of x is b and v of y is a which is the original post condition. We wanted to show that V of X is B and V of Y is A. Um, we have this additional thing that uh, we have built up thanks to direct application of the rule. And this is why um, we will have to use this rule of consequence to split it out, right? So by directly applying um, the steps that uh, we have, the syntax driven steps, you will end up with the Post condition that is stronger than the intuitive one that you want to prove. One second. I got a call. Um, I just muted. Apologies for that. So, this is the reason why we need that uh, rule of consequence in order to show that this thing that you have here implies the intuitive one that um, we have here. Right? So, that is what uh, we want to do. Uh, let's just quickly go through that uh, in cock and then we will finish the lecture here. Um, so yeah, so it's the same example. So uh, observe that uh, underscore and V is just, uh, I am ignoring the heap position here, right? Um, in this valuation, X is A and Y is B. I'm going to write this program, swap program, which is going to give me X is B and Y is A. As I mentioned before, right? Um, at every step, you try um, one of the syntactic steps or the or the strengthening one if it doesn't unify. Here, we simplify it. We have sequencing. Let's do sequ sequencing first. Uh, and then you are going to do assignment. Let's do assignment. And then one more sequencing, right? There is a sequence here. 
let's do sequence here the conditions get uh, bigger and bigger but that's fine the side conditions that we are building right that is getting bigger that's fine we are doing assignment here so directly call the assignment rule simplify it uh, uh, little bit and now observe that uh, there is an assignment rule right there is some bunch of preconditions and then we have a post condition right and what we want is that uh, we will we know we can get a post condition for this and we know that uh, if the program is right the post condition is going to include this complexity but it is going to imply the property that uh, we want to show here which is just something about x and uh, y and uh, we don't care about anything that it says about uh, say temp here right temp here so this is exactly the place where we sort of apply the um, strength and post condition so what we are claiming here is that i will get you a stronger post condition q prime right and i will actually show that this q prime uh, which is this unification variable here implies the intuitive post condition that you want to prove right so we split it up we now again apply just the syntactic rule and if you simplify we will get a side condition right this is the side condition that i uh, mentioned assuming something about the uh, the valuation and uh, some equality is here right i just want to show that uh, these two properties hold this can be discharged directly with the solver that we had built up the t is the solver that goes through right in fact um, this is uh, showing you each of the steps but in fact here is the entire automated uh, procedure right this is like a very very baby step uh, automation but here is hxt is our automated solver for whole logic programs right given a whole logic uh, um, core triple where you have a precondition a program and post condition here is a solver for it the solver can automatically uh, prove it if it uh, uh, in fact uh, is correct right if you do hd no more sub goals so this is sort of leading towards this automated program verification right so we are we built uh, enough infrastructure so that this can automatically be discharged of course if you change this to some uh, then uh, this won't go through right so you will have to show that uh, if you look up a 10 you get a 10 but uh, you don't have anything right an arbitrary heap and valuation i am expecting to show 10 which will not hold right so yeah so that's the that's the power of uh, code logic right we can reason about uh, there are two things right there is there is this composition compositionality which is in order to look at a program you can look at simple sub commands and syntactically drive what is required and thanks to just the logic you can compose them together and then you have this automated procedure right so um so yes so this is this is very powerful technique we'll see more examples and we will see an actual application of this in um, uh f star right so we will get to that later so i'll stop here and uh, yeah i was supposed to finish early but uh, i didn't need to um but yes but we'll catch up tomorrow uh, thanks everyone